So Genesis chapter 39. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, who's the emperor, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who'd brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that Joseph did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favour in his sight and attended him. And Potiphar made Joseph overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So Potiphar left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused, and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in his house, and he's put everything that he has in my charge. He's not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can can I do this great wickedness? And sin against God. And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he wouldn't listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he'd left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of the household and said to them, See, he, Potiphar, has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. And he came into me to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came into me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, This is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. There's an interesting question to ask, against whom? Was it against Joseph or against her? If it was against Joseph, surely he'd have executed him. Anyway, let's keep reading. Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And Joseph was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, Joseph was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Let's pray. Father, we know that this was written for our instruction, 
So please, would your Holy Spirit, who inspired Moses to write these words, would you send him among us to be our teacher? For Jesus' sake. Amen. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. That's verse 2 of chapter 39 of Genesis. A successful man. So what's your idea of success in life? A successful person. Let me put it this way, if I may. When the day of your funeral arrives, and someone gives a tribute... What are they going to say? What would you like them to say? And how should you live now in order that they can, in good faith, say what you would like them to say on that day? The Lord was with Joseph, and Joseph became a successful man. That's verse 2. Interesting, at the end of the chapter... In a very different context, exactly the same language is used. Verse 23, whatever Joseph did, the Lord made it succeed. Success. So what is God's idea of success in our lives? That's the question we're going to be looking at today. Last time in chapter 38, we saw in Judah the world's idea of success. Here, in chapter 39, we see in sharp contrast God's idea of success. There are two things that, it's like a coin with two sides in some ways. Number one, if we understand what God's idea of success is, number one, it is God with us, not against us, God with us. And we see that in the opening verses, verses 2 to 6a, and the closing verses, 20 to 23, are, are bracketing of the whole chapter and the story in the middle. And we're looking at the reality of God's presence regardless of circumstances. In verses 2 and 3, Joseph, though a slave, quickly rises to the top of the tree. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with Joseph. And that the Lord caused all that Joseph did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favour in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. So here is Joseph's career soaring upwards. He has the Midas touch. Everything he touches turns to gold. Verse 5, from the time that he made him, Potiphar made Joseph overseer in his house and over all that he had. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So despite Joseph's lowly status as a foreign slave, he found favor in the sight of his powerful master Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the emperor. Potiphar is the captain of the emperor's guard. And we're tempted to say, well, of course, that's what success looks like. A fancy job title with some real power over people, a fancy office, a fancy apartment, a fancy chariot, no doubt. All the trappings of success. But one of the truly striking things about this chapter is the way it's framed. When Joseph is summarily dismissed and thrown into jail on a false charge, As I hinted in the reading, I'm not sure. That's exciting. Um, So when Joseph is dismissed and thrown into jail on a false charge, and and, and as, as as I hinted, I'm not sure Potiphar believes his wife. There's clearly tension between them. You can see that in the language that she uses. Yet, from the description of what happens, here is Joseph now thrown into prison, Exactly the same language of success is employed. Did you see that? So verse 20. Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And Joseph was there in prison. That's going to look great on the CV, isn't it? But the Lord was with Joseph. 
And he showed him steadfast love and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, Joseph was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention. We've heard this language before. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge, just like Potiphar did, because the Lord was with him. Whatever Joseph did, the Lord made it succeed. So do you you see the language is exactly the same about success, but the circumstances could not be more different. In verses 1 to 6, Joseph is a top man in a top job, the envy of all around In verses 21 to 23, Joseph is a nobody. He shafted and shoveled down the chute straight into a prison cell. But from God's perspective, nothing has changed. The Lord was no less with Joseph in the prison than with Joseph in the palace. So easy, isn't it, to judge by, to judge success by external things I don't know how you judge success in your life is it the number of social media followers you have that's not for me your exam results did you get that great result the university you're going to or went to your personal power or influence either in your family or your place of work your social status how people think about you and talk about you your career advancement the chosen career that you have just how quickly you're going up the ladder of success is that how we judge things well the first thing we need to learn about god's idea of success is that the key thing is the reality of god's presence regardless of circumstances it just doesn't matter what our circumstances are in regard to the world whether the world looks at our cv and says "Ooh, that's fantastic or looks at our cv and says oh what about that gap explain that to us or what you ended up there no god's idea of success is god with us wherever whatever regardless of circumstances. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is us with God. Us with God and not against God. Verses 6b to 19, the central section. And here we can put it in these terms. If the first is the reality of God's presence regardless of circumstances, here it is the restraint of God's presence regardless of temptations. The restraint of God's presence regardless of temptations now it's a classic story of desire and seduction could be a man on a woman it happens to be a woman on a man verse 6b Joseph was well one translation has it handsome and well built a bit of a hunk and good looking to boot now remember the beginning of chapter 37 We're told that Joseph was only 17 when he was sold by his brothers. But 17 upwards, as every 17-year-old knows, is growing into manhood. And verse 7, after a time, Potiphar's wife, is the phrase, cast her eyes on Joseph. So often that's where it begins, isn't it? A looking up and down and side to side, taking it all in. And then one day, the startling proposition, lie with me, come to bed with me. But Joseph refuses, verse 8, and says, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in his house. He's put everything that he has in my charge. He's not greater in the house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you're his wife. How then? Can I do this thing, this great wickedness and sin against God? So Joseph refuses. Now, how come he refuses? What kept him on the straight and narrow? What stopped him saying to himself, Wow, wow, she loves me. She's my master. I mean, who am I to refuse her? I'm just a slave. What stopped him saying, Well, I could allow my feelings to grow for her and I can't think straight then. 
Well, we're not told how it came to be, but what we do see is that Joseph is thinking really clearly. And it's that clear thinking that he's come to. And again, we're not told the process. We're just told the result, that he's, he's very clear in his thinking. And his thinking is God's thinking. He's clear on God's boundaries. Do you see it in verse 9? He calls this proposition great wickedness. And he's clear on the nature of sin. Yes, it would have been a sin against Potiphar, of course. But actually, fundamentally, end of verse 9, it is sin against God. Great wickedness, sin against God. Now the reality is, each of us faces daily temptations. It's a battle every day, isn't it? That, that's the truth. That's why, one of the reasons why it's great to pray the Lord's Prayer when we gather. Every time. You say, well, can't we change it? Well, it's the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray. It's his words. And included in it, as you know as well as I, is that prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now you say, well, I'm not sure that's ever answered in my case. I'm always being led into temptation. Well, hang on a minute. It depends what you mean by led into temptation. Because I think what it's talking about is, is led into temptations in such a way that you are overpowered. That's what we're praying against. We face temptation all the time. The challenge is not to give in to it. To be delivered from the evil one and his ability to make us give in to temptation. That's what we want to be delivered from. We need to be clear on God's boundaries and the nature of sin. To break his boundaries is great wickedness and sin itself is against God. Oh, it may give us a temporary thrill, but it's an evil thing. It's against God. We, we might face, if, if you're stupid enough to sleep with someone's wife and you're a man, you might face the wrath of a husband. If you're stupid enough to have an affair, you might have to face the anger of your kids. But that is nothing compared to the wrath of God. For whoever else is wronged by our sin, it is first and foremost against God that we sin when we sin. And Joseph, young as he was, maybe still a teenager, had got that clear. Have we? I've always found that, that an awareness of the presence of God at all times with me, against whom I would be sinning if I sinned is a powerful restraint against falling into temptation. And it's no good thinking, well, I, I did quite well yesterday, so I should be all right for today. No, you have to start again every day. Joseph had to keep on resisting. Verse 10, Potiphar's wife spoke to Joseph day after day. Here's a quote from Derek Kidner, whose commentary on Genesis I love. He says, The long attrition reopening the closed question. He said what his answer was the first time she'd made the proposition. He answered in verse 8 and 9. But oh no, she keeps opening the question again. His quote continues, Now the final, now the final ambush, where all is lost and won in a moment. Joseph's flight, unlike a coward's, saved his honour at the cost of his prospects. The New Testament recommends it too. That is to say, flee! Now, it's quite interesting to stop and note the components of a defence against continuing temptation, that daily temptation. And you know what your particular temptation is that you battle with every day. Well, here are some, I think, some excellent advice as to how to cope with continuing temptation. Do you see in verse 10, she spoke to Joseph day after day. He would not listen to her. 
He metaphorically stopped his ears. Now, I presume he didn't go like this and go, la, 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 la. But he did metaphorically in his head. He's, I'm, I'm not, he was saying to himself, don't listen to her. He would not listen to her. That's the first thing. Secondly, he wouldn't be... Well, the, the, our translation says he would not lie beside her. Uh, I think it, it's probably that they would recline um, on sort of couches like we would sit on seats. So I think in terms of our understanding, it's, he wouldn't sit near her. And when she said, oh, Joseph, come, come and have a seat. Let's, let's have a chat about how things are going or about the weather. Uh, he just refused to be near her. And more than that, he wouldn't be with her. So it seems that if he found her in a space in, in, the, in the house or the garden, he would immediately exit the space. An avoidance strategy. And when the crisis hit and she grabbed him by his coat, he fled, verse 12, and got out of the house. So Paul says to Timothy, we read one of the examples, there's another one in, in 2 Timothy 2, 22, where Paul says to the young Timothy, flee the temptations of youth. Just don't discuss, don't negotiate, don't ponder, flee, run for your life. And those temptations aren't just lust, it's pride as well. You know so much when you're young, don't you? But I don't know what your temptation is. Internet porn, drink, drugs. Keep a distance. Don't be near them. I know a young man who was continually pestered by the young woman who sat in his room as a trainee. She kept inviting him back for dinner after work. She was married, he was not. When he inquired about whether her husband was going to be there, the answer was always rather vague. He travelled a lot on business, did the husband. He smelt a rat and he decided he would never go for dinner and he never did. Take the avoidance path. Take the way of escape. Turn for a moment to, to 1 Corinthians 10. I, I love this advice of the Apostle Paul. He's just talked about how things written in the Old Testament are written as examples for us. He's talking about a different example, but he says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, Now these things, and we could include in that the story of Joseph in Genesis 20, 39, I think, these things happened as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Now just think about that for a moment. It's that awareness that I could fall is critical to our stand against temptation. If I may speak personally for a moment. Um, I know perfectly well, and I've known ever since I was a teenager, I've known perfectly well that I am capable of having an affair. And you may be shocked to hear that, but that's the truth. But it's that knowledge that I know I'm capable of it which has kept me from it. Because I know that I could fall. I don't want to be a man who thinks that he stands and won't fall. We need to be aware of our foibles, of our weaknesses. And I thank God I've not been that stupid and pray I never will be. But let's read on. We need to start with that awareness. I could fall here. I could get addicted to internet porn or whatever it might be. Then the encouragement, verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to human beings. Don't think that the one you're battling with is unique. Well, no one else has this, so somehow you've got a special ticket, an exemption, because yours is a unique temptation. No, your temptation, many, many people struggle with. And God is faithful, 
And here's the great promise in the face of temptation. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. You will not be crushed and destroyed by this temptation. But with the temptation, God will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You can cope with it and come through it. The way of escape. So when you're facing that temptation, when the temptation is really hot and pressing you, that is the moment to look around for the emergency exit. There, there it is. I knew there was an emergency exit. Because God had promised that with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. And he will. All we need to do is look for it and then take it. One, one final cross-reference before we have a couple of closing thoughts. Hebrews chapter 4. Because you may say, well, okay, I, I struggle with my temptation, uh, but I sometimes wonder whether God really understands what I'm going through. Yes, Jesus came down, the Son of God came and became one of us. He was as human as I am, but it was different for him. Well, how is it different for him? Let's read just Hebrews 4, 14. Since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens. In other words, who's got all the way to God. The Jewish understanding was there are a number of heavens. Well, writing to a Jewish readership, the writer says, don't worry, Jesus has got all the way through the heavens. For we do not have a high priest, verse 15, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now one of our temptations, if I can use that word at this point, is to say, ah, but it was easier for him because he was never going to give in, was he? So he doesn't really know what it's like to really struggle like we do. To which the response is, actually, it was harder for him. We say, how harder? He never gave in. Ah, but that's the point. If you give in to temptation, the battle is over. You've lost. Let's move on. Well, yeah, forgiveness and another chance, sure. But the hardness of the temptation is when you resist it. And the devil keeps pushing you and your sinful nature, keep, nature keeps pushing you. And you still resist. That's when it's hard and gets harder as you continue to resist. So actually for Jesus, it was harder than it's ever going to be for us. Because he never gave in. He always kept fighting that temptation. So yes, it's true, he does know what it's like to be tempted. He is able to sympathise with our weaknesses. Which is wonderful that we come, and therefore, verse 16, we can with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy if we do fall, if we give in to the temptation, there is mercy, and find grace to help in time of need. The next time we face the temptation, there is the grace, the strength to help us fight it and not give in. God's idea of success, two final reflections. Number one, consider the career of Christ. Was our Lord Jesus Christ's earthly career a success or a failure? The probability is that Jesus lost his father when he was a young man. There's no reference to Joseph, his stepfather that is, um, from the age of when he was 12, do you remember that visit to the temple and his, father's mention, his stepfather's mentioned there? After that, no mention of Joseph at all, just Mary, which makes most people think that his stepfather died. Now, his stepfather ran a joinery business, which we know Jesus was involved in, and it probably means that he took over his father's joinery business and ran it until he was 30. And then he gave it up and became an itinerant preacher. But his real mission was to give his life as a ransom for the sins of many. 
And if Joseph was humbled by the false accusation which landed him in prison, how much more was the Lord Jesus Christ humbled by the path that took him to the cross and all the false accusations along the way? And shortly before his untimely death, he said to some of his close followers, and you read this in John 12, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be... Now, how would you complete that sentence? The hour has come for the Son of Man to be... Crucified? It'd be a fair finishing of the sentence, wouldn't it? But that's not what Jesus says. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He's talking about his own death. He's come to give his life. And then he talks about those who follow him. He says immediately afterwards, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus' life, in God's eyes, was the most successful life ever lived. But it went the way of the cross. And our call is to follow the same path of self-denial and service and rely on the steadfast love of the Lord, whatever happens. Consider the career of the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, briefly, remember and this is the thing that I do want us all to remember from this morning, is character, not career, is what counts. Character, not career, is what counts. When we stand before God on the final day to give an account for our lives, if we're Christians, we're not afraid of being rejected. But Christ has taken away our sins and borne our condemnation and given us the gift of righteousness. We stand before God, righteous in Christ. But that doesn't mean we escape assessment of our lives by God. Unlike an obituary, our career in this world will not get a mention. Except insofar as it was the context in which God put us to grow in godly character, and to exercise godly influence. For what God cares about is our character, not our career. That is his idea of success. Let's pray.